like penguins hang out by there. <laughs> like, we went to hang out with the penguins. Yeah. <gasps> really? Yeah. There's a town oh, called Simon's Town outside full of penguins. And we, that's it's incredible. beautiful. That's incredible. What an experience. It's, so it's did crazy. you have to fly there from Europe or how do you even get to South Africa? It's a long flight. Um, it was almost 24 hours or, or, you know, if you, if you were lucky to get like just one layover, very few places had a direct flight from the U.S. to Cape Town. So right. you'd have to go to Joburg, jo Johannesburg first. Mm -hmm. Some people were flying for almost two days because of right. layovers. You know, from L.A., they would have to go to Istanbul or something, you know. I, I went to, uh, I had a direct from New York to Johannesburg, which was amazing. So it was, a, it was a, an 18-hour flight. And then New York to Johannesburg? Johannesburg. Oh, you got hella lucky. Yeah, and oh, then that well, that's my second time in Johannesburg. Um, the first time I went was a theater festival in the in the nineties, and it was crazier back then. Wow. Um, yeah, but How uh, much? This, so you've been to Johannesburg like thirty years apart? Yeah. Like Twenty five <laughs> years apart? About thirty years apart. Yeah. That's incredible. So you've really gotten to see. So the first time you were there for theater, how long were you there? I was there for about, it was a tour that went, that performed in an international theater festival in Johannesburg and uh, in, e in Cairo, Egypt. So we went to both those um, cities on the same tour. This was, um, I think it was about a month in Africa. So you really got a good, yeah, I figure if you're going to travel that long of a distance, you're not just going to go for the weekend you know <laughs> like, no 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 we were gonna get there we were gonna perform you know absolutely. so we were doing workshops we we're performing um uh, yeah but you really got to see africa like a couple different parts of africa like 25 30 years apart so what did you think about like johannesburg then versus now well i mean you know i'm not an expert at the politics i could only ex i could only tell you what i experienced but when the first time i was there was 1993 and it was when nelson mandela came into power the, and it was when the fall of apartheid it was amazing the energy of the the country was like all about fresh new hope you know like um, here now with biden and harris it's like, kind of, it was even more just tremendous Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm Even sure. Even more. I mean, people were coming, were coming from the countryside, yeah. you know, to, to the to the big city because they were like, finally, there's hope that we, you know we're going to go to work, and I think that it didn't happen fast enough. So there, so it was still a little dangerous, you know, because people came and there were no jobs. Um, so, but but there was a lot of there was a lot of hope. I would say, you know, all you know, um, and now I would say. Wait, that, was that the end of apartheid? That was the end of apartheid. That's when Nelson Mandela came into power. Yeah, oh, it, it was at that moment. Incredible! It was oh incredible. Gosh. It was quite a moment. That was one of those moments, like the fall of the Berlin Wall or something, that was mm -hmm. just like monumental in world history. Completely. That's so cool. Was, we were yeah. caught up in all of that. It was. It was quite amazing. Um, and I would say that in the thirty years and going back, it's gotten better. And I think that there are practices and laws. Uh, in place that are what like in America we call affirmative action um, to help black and you know and then there's a a group of people called colored people which means the mixed people the mixed race people yeah. um, to help them because you know they could see the the devastating effects of apartheid and how could they actually right the wrongs of apartheid and so they have laws in place um, and you know warrior the production had to actually abide by some of them by having to hire black and colored people into um, professional jobs, you know? So like, like they had to actually hire uh, people that they can train into like handling the camera, focusing the lights and actually give them, give them like uh, a, um, experience in working on a professional level. So that's the job, uh, I forgot what it was called. It was some, you know, it's like the better black business or something like that. We need um, that in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> like if you look at like the USC, what is it like the Annenberg studies on diversity in Hollywood and stuff like, and at least they finally had that, um, that like mass, uh, they added more like women and people of color to the motion picture academy than ever, like just all at once. <laughs> right, right. And a lot of that, I think for, for us in America, that was pressure from social media. Absolutely. Right? Like yeah. Oscar for white hashtag. If we left it up, 
to the the, the, the executives they would just be like oh just keep him. waiting you just, just wait we'll get to you eventually right <laughs> right. Right. right sure <laughs> so yeah it's um i think there's still a lot of problems in south africa there's still a lot of townships a lot of poor people crime is still high you know but they're trying it seems like they're trying whereas in america it, we were not trying at all you know the last four years we were like regressing, you know, so that was quite a, a start. I didn't just sign something yesterday or today. It was um, to do something about all of the anti-Asian American, like hate crimes, literally hate crimes and domestic terror that have been going on that were fed by Trump. I mean, Trump keep, kept calling it the China virus. I think, didn't he just call it the China virus? Like on his exit speech, he still called yeah. it the China virus. And, and it was because of him that there was a rise in anti-Asian violence. Absolutely. You know, something needs to be done about that. I'm glad that finally we have a president in place who is the opposite of calling it the China virus. He actually finally like signed some uh, legislation about doing something to combat anti-Asian crime and, and terrorism. So. It's like yin and yang, having the two opposites. You know, what, one president was divisive and violent and the other is about peace and unity. Yeah, and I just have, I just felt like this huge uh, collective sigh of relief since, uh, since the election, the inauguration, you know. I'm just, now it's like, looking like Republican senators don't want to convict him. I'm just like, the man literally stormed into your office and tried to assassinate you, and you still are, like, in his fan club. That's the part I don't get. <laughs> so that's where the U.S. and South Africa are similar. There's, there's just, um, yeah, um, you know, politicians. They're just, it's corrupt. There's a lot of corruption in South Africa also. And then, you know, uh, Trump allowed us to see how much corruption there is in the U.S. Yeah, I really got spoiled with the Obamas because I was like, oh, we have a half black president and everything must be fine. And I just kind of like turned a blind eye to what was going on with immigration and foreign policy and a lot of things because, you know, it wasn't so in your face. And I also like, I also had a really low opinion of Democrats. Like I thought, like I'm a radical, like people call me a liberal and I take it as an insult. <laughs> um, but I've always been like a radical or like green or independent, right? Because I'm from San Francisco and I think like that Democrats are just like weak and wishy-washy and they're not progressive enough, you know? And, um, but then I was just like, damn, the stuff these people have to put up with, like actual neo-Nazis. Like I have to put up with like neo-Nazis leaving me rude comments on Facebook and then I block them and I hope that they don't become cyber stalkers and come find me. Um, but they have to actually put up with that like just every day, like these neo-Nazis can very easily find out where they live. Everybody knows where their office is, you know? And so I just have like this sudden, like newfound respect for, I mean, I will always be critical of our government. I'm not Joe Biden or Kamala Harris's biggest fan, but of course I voted for them. I don't vote for people based on whether I think that we'll be best friends. I vote for people based on who I think is gonna be the best political leader, you know? And so, but yeah, I have a newfound respect for the Democrats because I was just like, damn, the, the stuff they put up with <laughs> just to do their jobs. In this particular election, it was really about anyone that can get Trump out of office. Oh, you absolutely. Know, anyone, that, anyone is better than Trump. So that, that was the choice a lot of us had. Yeah. So are you in New York now? Or are you... Um... Well, I'm still based in New York, but right now we, we've uh, rented a house in Rhode Island just to, just, you know, ride out the pandemic. So I might be back in New York City in March. Awesome. Yay. And I was trying to look, do some research on you, and I found that there's not much out there. And that, at first, it confused me because I was like, this guy's been in acting since, like, for decades. And then what I did find was an interview where you explained that you actually put your acting career on hold first to pursue music and then to be a stay-at-home dad. And so I thought that was really um, 
kind of came through in the Father Jin character, and I'm interested to watch Boogie and see, because in both of those roles, it seems like you have, well, obviously Father Jin is not only the leader of the most powerful uh, Tong in Chinatown, but he's also the literal father of the up and coming character, um, Young Jun. And then also it seems like in Boogie, like you again have this sort of father figure mentor role. And I was wondering like, um, do you think that, do you, like how do you think your experience in like being a stay at home dad, raising kids or whatever, and then like, do you think you were able to put that into your characters? Most definitely. I mean, um, yeah, it's kind of funny, you know, when I, going back to what you said about putting my career on hold, um, in the, in the, I think it must have been around 2000. Um, well, you know, when I first started doing theater in New York around 93 or 4, it, people recommended me to try TV and film also because that, in that way you can make a living actually at, at acting. Um, so when I started to, to look into it, I, I saw that there was really nothing I can audition for. And there wasn't much in the 90s on television for, for an Asian American man. I mean, there was whenever, you know, like Law and Order would have the Chinatown scene or something, then, then they, they would be auditioning <laughs> gangsters or, you know, like waiters and stuff. Other than that, there weren't much. Um, and then Lost came about, you know, with Daniel Day Kim. And that was like, oh, there's an Asian American. There, well, he's Asian American, but his character is Korean. Uh, Daniel Day Kim was my friend. And we, we hung out in New York. We, we were pounding the pavement together in theater. And so when he made it in TV, you know, by that time, I was already like, had given up for years because it was like, there was nothing. So I found that, um, and then, you know, with kids coming, I, I found a more, a way to make money being a flute maker at home, and I could actually be the stay-at-home dad. Um, so I was extremely fortunate. Um, so, but I was able to do like one theater production a year just to keep my foot in the door, you know? Otherwise I would have just, you know, been driving myself crazy. Um, but as the kids grew up, um, you know, I started to feel like the itch to really get back on stage and you know, I was watching, at about that time, I saw Justin Lin's A Better uh, Luck Tomorrow. Um, and it was like, oh, shit, it's happening. You know, Lost is coming out, Better Luck Tomorrow is coming out. I mean, these are really popular films and uh, TV and film in popular culture. So I went, there's hope. This is the beginning. There's, you know, the last thing that was this big was the Joy Luck Club, you know, in the 80s or something. And it was like, it's been that long since something, you know, for Asian Americans. Um, and so my kids, my older son was maybe nine at the time and just old enough to like, not need me as much, you know, not need me to sit and read with him. And, you know, he could be like off on his own to do stuff. And so my, I was able to have time to like audition, to look at scripts and to like, to be, you know, with the process of auditioning. Um, so that nine years really set me up to be, I was a parent. I was a full-blown father for nine years. And um, seeing these roles, definitely, like, I, I, I knew what to say. I knew what a father was, you know. I didn't have to, like, research it, you know. I was there and in the thick of it. And I, I had two boys, you know. And, I, and I, I had two brothers. And I saw what my father went through in Chinatown, um, rearing two, three boys, like the challenges of being an immigrant father in Chinatown, dealing with racism, you know, low paying jobs, um, the stress of whether your kids are gonna get into gangs. Like I knew that, I knew that world. So when I auditioned for, um, uh, you know, Father June, it was like, yeah, I, I know that person. I know the world, I know what he's doing. And I, I, I know what, everything behind what he says, I believe it. I don't have to research it. And with Boogie, it's kind of like the same thing. It's, it's about like, you know, knowing who your culture is and encouraging your son to be the best he could and making sure that he understands his place in the Chinese um, culture in terms of, you know, like being, valuing um, your family above all. It's like, that's Chinese culture. That's, that's a lot of Confucianism, and, you know. It's like understanding that you're in a hierarchy of family is the basis of Confucianism. And that's spread, you know, through a lot of Chinese cultures. And even I think if you're a third or fourth generation Asian American, 
you respect your parents a lot more than, than other cultures, I almost want to say, because it's built into the philosophy of Asian culture to respect your parents, to listen to what they say, and to put your own uh, feelings and thoughts behind what's important for the family. I mean, the big American philosophy is go out and be yourself. Individual. Go out and make your own. Family. Yeah. Once you're 18, move out of the house, right? Right. That's not what the predominant th thinking in, in Chinese, classical Chinese culture, and even today, you don't move out. You stay home. Right. You know? And I have a friend in Japan who, who lives in a four generation household, a very modern family. They stay together, you know, that's Asians. So, um, yeah, so, so being a parent and understanding that and, and how to enforce that upon the sons, I think was, was, important, uh, was an important understanding for me to get into the heads of Father June and Mr. Chin, who's uh, Boogie's dad. Oh, it is his dad. Yeah, I, I play the father, yeah, Boogie's father. Okay. I only saw the preview, so I didn't know. And like, I saw like, I was like, oh, there's Perry and he's whipping his butt in a uh, basketball and like giving him some life advice. So I didn't know if you were the coach or what, but okay. I was actually it's coaching him in basketball at that moment. I was his basketball coach, but yet he, he's actually a really great basketball player and he, and he studies at school, you know, right. but I was actually private coaching him, but I am his father. Nice. Yay. I'm looking forward to that one. Um, and then it's cool because you get to be like the Chinatown dad in like two different time zones, <laughs> two different epochs. And, Actually, there's uh, another film called A Father's Son that I shot after Boogie. That's, uh, that's a short film based on Henry Chang's novels, um, Detective Yu novels. Like a, uh, a, like a oh, is that the one with the novel. black and white poster? Right, is right. That, is that coming out? That is going to be out, I think, sometime. It, it, it's almost done. So that's a short film, but it also has... Oh, the cast in that looked really... It was like the all-star cast one, right? Right. It's an all-star cast with Tai Ma and um, Ronnie Chang from Daily Show, who plays my son. You know, I'm his father. Right. So, oh, so you're getting all the Chinese dad roles now. I had all the <laughs> Chinese dad roles, which was pretty funny. So I, I, I like to joke that, um, you know, when Tai Ma was in an interview and you know time off from Mulan and, and uh, a lot of other stuff Rush Hour and um, The Farewell recently like he, he plays America's favorite Asian dad you know like that was his role that that was a Vanity Fair article and I went oh Ty's my buddy so if Ty's going to be America's favorite Asian uh, favorite Asian dad I'm America's Asian bad dad <laughs> <laughs> the Chinese bad dad. Yeah. yeah, I'm the Chinese. I'm America's bad Asian dad, you know, um, which is fine, you know, because I didn't want to be the model minority, you know? Right. Um, I'm trying to, you got me thinking if Father Jin actually is, I don't think he's a bad dad. He came in and like literally guns a blazing and saved his like brat son's life after his brat son like practically turned him out from his own gang. Like... Uh, how is he bad? You're talking about season two episode. I'm, th I'm thinking he's badass dad. He's that's not a bad dad. Yeah. Yes. However you interpret it is badass and bad. Uh, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like some some people can look at like Father June as this archetypal kind of patriarch. You know, he's just he's just he's like the Dilo. You know, I know I know people like that. I know men like that in San Francisco Chinatown now. And like they sing karaoke and play mahjong, but <laughs> exactly. So I, I mean, it's written as one of those guys. He is the patriarch of Chinatown, right? So, right. so I had to be that guy. But also, they're had still to here. Go. Let me tell you, they are still here. <laughs> they are still there. Yeah, I know them well. I I grew up with them. You know, my right. uncles and all, all my extended uncles. Oh yeah, you know, they're all still here. Guys in the mahjong parlors, you know. Definitely. You know, click, I, know click, 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 click. <laughs> I know them very well. Yes. But I just wanted to, if if there were opportunity anywhere in the script to offer them more dynamic character, you know, the range. Like, so we get to know these people as, um, you know, which I, was, which I was really happy with uh, the writing. Uh, I mean, I was happy with the writing in season one, but like in season two, Jonathan and the other writers were like, let's make Father June even more of a father. 
you know? So I got to be more of a father than just, than just a Chinatown, you know, a Tong leader. Right. Yeah. He got more personal. You got more like backstory on him or like more of his like internal like motivations got to come out and stuff, which I love that because like you said, it's been like a hundred something years of, uh, laundry workers and chop suey <laughs> waiters and that was about it. Seen, yeah, I don't think we've ever seen a, a Chinese American father and son relationship on TV. Yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm I mean, like, I don't think so. You know, I mean, not dramatically. I mean, we we yeah. had we had like comedy, like Fresh Off the Boat, right? And maybe a couple of other things. I'm not quite sure. You know, like, but like to not actually have a full fully flushed out story and relationship between Chi a Chinese American father and son. I don't think we've ever seen that. Right. Until... Especially not with like some backstory where like the dad has his, had his own whole life before the son even got there. And so that's like kind of, you know, like coloring all of their experiences and stuff. Yeah. It's very... which is the real, well, yeah, which is really amazing. Cause I think Boogie does that too. And we, I don't think we've ever seen a real Chinese, uh, a film from Hollywood. Because Boogie is a Hollywood film. And so we've never really seen a Chinese father in, a, a, you know, like, I think the last time was like Joy Luck Club. Or Isn't that crazy? We while. haven't gotten to be humans. And let me tell you that it's, that Asians in movies are so small. I actually had a, um, a friend of mine, I went to um, art high school in San Francisco, well, just for one year because I tested out, but I went to art high school in San Francisco for theater acting. I went to it's high so school. so long, I don't remember it. But. Yeah, but like, it, that's how small it is, is that, and then like Amy Tan lived in San Francisco. And so like, we would have fundraisers for like arts and schools. And um, I remember they would like have me dress up in like Renaissance outfits from the San Francisco opera and be like, um, I don't know what, what do you call that? When they have these like fundraisers and they just have like character people milling down <laughs> the audience, like that was like, so, but they wanted to show like, oh, this is an arts. Cause I was a California state art scholar in acting oh. at the time. And so they wanted to show like, I'm like a, a underprivileged urban oh, wow. youth. <laughs> that was like benefiting from all these like rich people don't and all the women would wanted to know was how I got my boobs to stand up they were like what did you do to your and I'm like 12 and I'm like it's a corset I got it from the opera like <laughs> yeah <laughs> but that was like my experience of like meeting Amy Tan I mean she was like a patron of the arts so I guess she was right. like a donor or she was like on the board of these arts organizations or something <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> but that was my memory of the Joy Luck Club was like I remember meeting Amy Tan at um arts fundraisers like mm. these like gala events and stuff <laughs> well, that movie did so, so much weird. that movie did a lot it made it put it put Asian Americans on the map in terms of Hollywood it really did kind of but you know unfortunately nothing happened after that for us right I remember reading the book and like really relating to her um her descriptions of her relationship with her mother and just <laughs> like just how dysfunctional it is to be like a American daughter of like a Chinese woman. <laughs> Welcome to our world. <laughs> right. But then literally like all the things that she would describe like Waverly Place and Chinatown and all, you know, all that stuff was like literally it was like stuff from my life, which was interesting to because like the only other person who was like a super popular writer, novelist, who actually also happened to be from San Francisco, was Daniel Steele. And so like, of course, like I can't relate to, and I don't know if anybody can relate to anything in a Daniel Steele novel, <laughs> but like literally like everything in Daniel Steele novels are like super waspy, like the European American version of everything. And it was like literally nothing that I could relate to in her books. Um, but like, I remember reading the Joy Luck Club and being like, oh, it's like my life, but written by, you know, from, I guess she was a, like, I don't know, like a thirties or forties person in her perspective. And I was like in middle school or something, <laughs> but I, but you know what I mean? Like I could definitely relate to the stories of, you know, from oh, like her childhood memory stories, you know? Mm. Um, 
So one thing I'm excited about is actually Warrior going to HBO Max because I read something, I think Variety or something about um, HBO Max is going to be the platform where I think it was Warner Brothers is going to be distributing all of their features now. So yeah, so that could potentially be really huge for HBO Max as far as like I would assume that if that's going to be the case, that they're going to get like a huge advertising push or they're going to get, I mean, they have to get a lot more viewers filtering or being directed to HBO Max if that's where all the, because that's like, they're literally, they're sitting on like something like $80 billion worth of productions that have been not distributed due to COVID. And so if they're planning on rolling all those out, as like first releases on HBO Max, I'm just gonna, I have to assume that means that there's gonna be a huge investment in HBO Max. It's gonna bode well for for Warrior. I mean, I I felt a huge um, rush, tidal wave of of, uh, activity, you know, towards um, my social media because of, um, because once we moved to HBO Max, it was like, wow, there's a wall of audience that just opened up to us. And it was quite amazing. Um, yeah. Everyone's just like, you know, why didn't why didn't I hear about the show till now? You know, and it's already been out, you know, two seasons. Um, this, you know, Cinemax is quite a small special subscription show for HBO, and a lot of people don't even know what Cinemax is. So, um, and I guess it was, I think Justin probably um, and Shannon probably decided on Cinemax because they gave us a budget and they liked Jonathan Tropper and, and they, they knew that they'd get something really interesting and, and you know, action packed for Cinemax. Um, they and might not have, afraid of like risque content or controversial content, right? So I feel like maybe they'd have a broader artistic license. They can do Cinemax. more. Yeah, they could definitely do more with violence and-, and Nudity. Nudity. With, Cinem- with Cinemax, right. So um, I don't, yeah, I mean, then there's a bit of that, you know, in, in Warrior. Um, so but I, I feel like it's tasteful and it goes with the story. Like, it's not like Game of Thrones style, like, nudity, you know, which I felt like there was, a, especially, like, with uh, Game of Thrones, they had a lot of, like, sexual assault scenes that were, like, ended up being very controversial because they were done in what people felt like was, like, a really disrespectful kind of way, you know? Hello, and sorry to interrupt this interview. Thank you to everyone who has been waiting for this part two since January. This is an update as to why it took me so long to upload this and what has happened since the interview was recorded. Of course, the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes has finally gotten a little bit of media attention. Boogie was released, and there should be a link to that below. I spent the month of March 2021 filming and editing a short film for the HBO Asian Pacific Islander Visionaries program. The winners will not be announced until September. If it wins, it will get published on HBO Max, just like Warrior. If it doesn't win, I want to release it to my YouTube channel so that everyone can watch it for free because it's an important topic. The subject of that short film is anti-Asian hate crimes in San Francisco Chinatown and four female Asian art students who join together to protect their, the seniors in their community. I'm very proud of it because it has seven Asian female lead characters. It's called Kung Flu, Yellow Peril Pushes Back. It's both a standalone short film and a prequel episode for my martial arts sci-fi dystopian social commentary series, SF Invictus. When I was fundraising and casting for Kung Flu, I got a lot of online hate about how anti-Asian hate crimes aren't real and that it was only black people committing those hate crimes. After I filmed the movie, the Georgia Spa mass shooting happened. Then I got a bunch of messages about how my film was so timely and trendy. That is not something that you want to be a trend. Media companies of all kinds started pledging to support Asian representations in media. The Warrior fan campaign kept growing stronger. 
Finally, Warrior was renewed for season three by HBO Max and Warner Media. Likewise, I spent the month of April and half of May working on an anti-police brutality advocacy project, and we will be moving forward with SF Invictus throughout the rest of the year. Please look forward to more previews and episodes of SF Invictus and to season three of Warrior. Warrior is filmed in South Africa. SF Invictus is filmed in the real San Francisco Chinatown. Visit sfinvictus.net or shimenejao.net for more information. Um, everybody who donated $25 or more got one of these stickers, which is five inches wide on holographic rainbow effect uh, vinyl. And the, everyone on the cast and crew got one also. It has a cast of 15 actors. And... If you donated $50 or more, you also got one of these Alchemist Shao palm-free, handmade, COVID coronavirus killing, detergent-free, paraben-free, artificial fragrance-free, made in San Francisco, California, soaps. Um, this is Tea Tree Spirulina, and this is another version of Tea Tree Spirulina. And then this is lavender. And we're sold out of the red ones, which were lemongrass clothes. They're um, natural mica dyes. And you should be able to buy these stickers for $5 on the website without sfinvictus.net website without having to donate $25 or more. Um, and I should put these on my shimenejao.net website also. Anyway, thank you so much. Please subscribe, and I hope you enjoy the rest of this interview. I also have some other guests that have agreed to be interviewed that I just have to schedule with, and hopefully they will make it on here, and hopefully you will enjoy those as well. Thank you so much, and sorry for the, sorry for the delays and sorry for the interruptions. Um, the HBO APA visionary program had a really short deadline so we cranked that out in five weeks which was really insane and then we had another deadline for the um the police brutality advocacy project also and now that we've uh, met both of those deadlines I'm able to refocus on SF Invictus. So, thank you so much for watching, and please look forward to. We're inviting the whole cast of Kung Flu back for the first season of SF Invictus. So, as, hopefully, as many of them as can make it back. Continue the storyline. And it's not just the Asian storyline. I'm also Hispanic, Black, and Jewish, and Native American. So, guarantee there will be other storylines aside from just Asian representation. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, everybody experiences sex or nudity in their in their in a their own unique way, you know. So, I had I had, you know, I know that the women in the show um, own what they do. They're very empowered by the role, the characters and these are women who are like feminists women at the time who empower themselves against uh the system they find ways to buck the system and empower themselves um so so um but i think that you know the, there's a different lens now that can be seen from you know younger asian Amer Asi asian women or younger feminists who might think that oh we don't need that nudity we don't need those roles anymore for women and um, I know that people see it that way also. And then again, there are people who see it that, as that the women are kick-ass women, you know? So it just shows, speaks to the complexity of, of our culture and how we look at um, female sexuality and power for one thing and how they, and, and also like a show like ours, which is made for the male gaze, right? Hollywood, Cinemax, martial arts. Um, so it's made for a young male audience, but somehow there's also a lot of women in our audience, a lot of female fans too, you know? So I don't know if that was um, 
in, you know, by accident, but they found us. You know, I was kind of amazed that a lot of my, our fans are, are, are women. And I did watch her read an interview with uh, Olivia Chang, where she was saying about how she not just, oh, sorry about my emails, um, but she was saying about how it wasn't just this role, but she had another role coming up or recently that were both like sex worker, madam, prostitute type roles. And she was saying that she's trying to, obviously she's trying to move away from that stuff as a Chinese woman. But then the other reality is that the time period that Warrior is set in is like women weren't, Chinese women weren't really allowed into the United States. And so the reality is, is like uh, in the Chinese community, it was 10 men for every one female. And then the jobs that were available to the women were if you weren't a merchant's wife or like a domestic servant for somebody in the merchant class, you were gonna have a really crappy job or you were gonna be a sex worker or you were gonna have a really crappy sex work job. But, um, but I mean, it's kind of like, that's, that's the reality. If she was gonna be like a rich person, she was either gonna be a merchant's wife or she was gonna be a madam who owned a brothel. Like that's just, or, you know, Absolutely. a casino owner or something. But that was the reality of the times. Absolutely. The, sh the show is historically accurate. And the, the laws at the time, the anti-Chinese exclusion law, I mean, prevented women from coming. So there were no women. And, and it was a racist law based on not um, allowing Chinese men to start families in America. So it was like, you come here and work and go home. Right. You can come here, but you can't own real estate in California. You can't marry. You can't bring your wife or your kids. And exactly. there are no women here of your race. So you can't, and you, oh, and you can't marry or have kids with women of another race <laughs> unless you go to Washington State and get married and come back. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, so that the show brings up a lot of those questions and like how America was back then. And it's like, how far did we come from that? How far did we evolve from that? And, um, you know, some of it is quite far and some of it isn't, <laughs> you know? It's like not much has changed and while well, some things have changed. I mean, we have a, in, in Warrior, our mayor is still was, you know, politically, you know, was up for power grabs and scapegoating immigrants. And, you know, our last president was still doing that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Using his political power to get business contracts for his family members. Like that's what he's doing in Moria, right? He's like literally getting like a steel and construction contract for his wife's father's company. And then the dad dies. And so, you know, and that's like, it's so Trumpist. It's so and like, to, oh, yeah. are we going to punish him for using his own hotels and resorts? <laughs> Or, you know, and like having presidential money, like pay into his own companies. Right. 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 So that's all happening today in politics. And it was happening back then. You know, they're scapegoating yeah. immigrants, the Irish against the Chinese, you know, and then now today it's Mexicans and against the Muslims and Muslims against the Chinese. I mean, it's, you know, it's yeah. still the same it's coming out of the same handbook of, of I've had all these like San Francisco history groups because I'm trying to write my own well I because I just I live here and I want to know but also because I'm always trying to like write my own pieces and I want to want them to be historically accurate and I definitely grew up like with these like rose-colored glasses about just believing that San Francisco was this like diverse hippie paradise and um, but the more I learn about the history of San Francisco, the more I realize that like, no, it's always been super racist and super segregated. And the things I love about it are actually a, a large part, in large part are like just the resilience of, like, I love the barrio, I love the mission, but a lot of that is because Latinos were segregated. And the same thing with Chinatown. I love Chinatown so much. But a lot of the reason why Chinatown exists is because it was a ghetto and like we were forced and trapped to be there and we turned hardship into something beautiful. And that's what culture and art does and community does, I feel like. So, but yeah, the more I learn about the history of San Francisco, like there was recently, like maybe like a, a year or two ago, there was a, a Chinese or Taiwanese couple that bought um, like a private street at auction because the tax bill had been unpaid for decades 
And it turned out that that was a private neighborhood that was constructed in this like yellow peril time. And they actually found the newspaper ads for when this like little gated subdivision, it's in San Francisco, um, but it's like multi, 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 like there's not a home on that block that isn't worth less than $8 million. Mm. Um, but the street parking is also privately owned because it was a private subdivision. So this Chinese couple like saw it at auction, they bought it and they were like, oh, we're gonna start charging these people you know, monthly parking rent. And then these, the, you know, entirely European American neighborhood was just like up in arms that like somebody bought their parking spaces. And it was just like, <laughs> it was just so hilarious to me that like they turned it on them, that they That's were it. like, the ads are horrible. The ads are like, come live in the only neighborhood where like evil Asian people are not allowed. <laughs> There was some, California was, was the place where there was the most anti-Chinese activity, you know, the, the yellow peril really, um, you know, took, started in, in San Francisco. It was really that, um, yeah, the warrior was all about that. It's, this is how it started right here. You know, the, the Chinese must go right when the Psalm gets off and see uh, the boat in episode one. Oh yeah. Like, yeah, the Chinese must go, you know, it was like all about, uh, political demagoguery. It's 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 Trump and his building the Mexican wall. That's what that is about, you know. And so it's it's um, yeah, it's history. You know, the the beautiful thing about Warrior is it really based the stories on authentic history. There now, there's a couple things that were anachronistic that threw me off. One is the dialogue, hmm. um, where they will when they're speaking Cantonese, like it'll go from subtitles and then they'll just switch to English and you're supposed to know that they're still speaking Cantonese, which I get that. But then there's like all of the like contemporary slang that they throw in. So that throws me off. And then the second thing that throws me off is like there's these Burning Man style costumes on all the sex workers. <laughs> <laughs> and so those are the only two things that like as like a a period nerd because I used to you know I used to study Shakespeare and all that crap so um but as a period nerd those were the two like kind of production choices that I was like hmm. <laughs> so well, do you know anything about mean, that or they, they didn't they wanted it to take place in the 1870s but they didn't want it to be an actual period piece you know they wanted it to feel like um contemporary so that it can have a contemporary audience um, you know, kind of like in the way Peaky Blinders is with, with contemporary music and fashion and haircuts. It takes place back then. The story takes place back then, but it's told with the freshness of today's, you know, style and music. So, um, yeah, so I think that, again, you know, it's like the female's body. A lot of people have their own take on, on those kind of artistic choices on like how, whether they want to see um, here hear the language spoken with like, you know, with Cantonese or are they speaking, when, when they switch over, what kind of English are they actually speaking? You know, like. That's I like that they didn't make them speak pidgin unless they're specifically speaking pidgin to like, cause I used, honestly, I used to do that. Like I used to be like the mysteriously mixed Asian woman working at a sushi restaurant. And if I got a really annoying customer, I would just pretend not to speak English. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, that, that's a specific choice that when they're, when they're in the company of white people, they have, if they speak any English, it's pidgin. But when right. there's no white people around, it's their natural language. Right, and so right. what is the natural language that the audience gets to hear? And mm -hmm. it, it, it's full of slang. It's a very contemporary English. Yeah. And I like that. And then they just have the one, the Andrew Koji, the lead character, Asam, like he obviously he speaks perfect English because that's part of his character and like obviously it's like that's something that sets him as, apart and that also allows him to have like um some like code switching moments because mm -hmm. he's able to communicate so right. him and yeah. Diane, uh, him and uh my ling because they were both the, right uh, an american grandfather in the story you know right um which is funny because that's how david carradine's kung fu was revealed that's why he speaks english it's because, I mean, there was something about him being left at the Shaolin Temple. And then he kind of had flashbacks about having a, uh, an American 
that show never made sense to me because I was always, always thrown off by the fact that he was a white guy. Like, I, I never understood that show. Like, I even had a problem with, um, more recently, the um, To All the Boys I've Loved Before, because she's supposed to be uh, Eurasian. Like, like, I didn't get that until, like, they, like, kind of, like, hammered it in in the dialogue because I was like, oh, she's adopted because she has a white dad. Mm. <laughs> and you're supposed to just know that she's Eurasian. And I'm just like, but she's very obviously not. She's very obviously, like, 100% Vietnamese. <laughs> like, yeah, um, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, sometimes it requires kind of a leap of, you know, um, what is that called? Uh, suspension of reality and disbelief yeah yeah so um but you know all it takes is a little hinting from the production and then right exactly like once they start talk once they started like talking about her dead mother and blah 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 i was like oh that's supposed to be, we're supposed to think that's her biological dad oh okay got it but like honestly like there was like 30 minutes of the movie where i was just like why are they saying that to her you know um but yeah, and then like the other thing is like obviously Andrew Koji is not Chinese and he's playing a character who's supposed to be Chinese and like, but honestly as an Asian actress, like I hope that someday if there's like a big Vietnamese or Korean or Japanese production that they'll consider me for a role. <laughs> and honestly, like I'm not even fully Chinese. So I'm always like, I've my whole life, it's been like, oh, you're not Asian enough. You're not Hispanic enough. You're not Jewish enough. You're not black enough. So it's like, I'm going to be the last person to nitpick like a literally like, oh, well, he's Asian, but he's not Chinese casting. But it did like, it does like, uh, when I read the interviews with Justin Lin or Shannon Lee, and they're like, they talk about how a big part of their inspiration to bring this to production was because Bruce Lee wrote this treatment and basically his whole idea was shot. And this has happened to me his idea was shot down and stolen and then given to white people. And like, he was never given any credit. He was never given any opportunity. Um, but then for them to then take that and be like, oh, and now we have this Japanese and he's not, he's like half British, right? He, yeah, he's so, Hapa. Right? Yeah. The term so Hapa, I'm, affectionately. Yeah. Um, half, uh, the, the term Hapa comes from Hawaii for half, Hapa, right. Hapa Hawaii. And so, Koji might not use that term, but I do from California. Um, I do too. Yeah, my brother. And so is, it. yeah, so he's half white British and half his uh, father's Japanese. And so is Jason Tobin. Who plays right, Sean he's Peter. Chinese and British too, right? So, yeah. And then yeah. another one of them is Vietnamese. One of the... Uh, Diane Dawn is Vietnamese. Right. Um, and so, and Dustin Nguyen is Vietnamese. Right, there he's also. So we have, there. and... Um, uh, uh, Joe Joe Taslim is Indonesian Chinese, mm -hmm. so we have quite a mix of of Asians. And I think you know uh, Shannon first said that Bruce Lee wanted to create opportunities for uh, Asian actors, not just for him, not just for Chinese actors. You know, so and probably I would think that it would be more like create opportunities for people of color. When you look at his films, you know, it's you see black people, right? Like, uh, or at least. Enter the Dragon, you know, he was catering to a huge, huge popular, uh, you know, his black audience, which was huge, you know, like African Americans came to, to embrace Bruce in the, in the 70s. Um, but yeah, getting back to Andrew Koji, um, it's, it's an opportunity for, the Warrior is a vehicle for people of color, I think, and it should represent like, you know, everyone should feel like they belong in the Warrior family that we should all feel like we're victims of white supremacy, you know, not just Chinese. It's like everybody who watches this is like, yes, I understand the show. I feel like I'm, you know, in the warrior family. Uh, and so I think that the sort of broad casting feeds, feeds, speaks to that. Um, and I, I think it's true when I look at Bruce Lee as a kid growing up, I feel like I belong, you know, it's like, like he's my friend, he's my uncle. And you could see like when I, when his first, his films first was showing it and became popular in downtown Oakland in the seventies, there'd be a block around the corner of black people wearing Chinese Kung Fu outfits. 
you know, in the 70s and Karate Gi. And you're like, wow, Bruce is, Bruce is making them feel like seen. These African-Americans, these black people in Oakland feel seen with Bruce, you know? And before that, we were getting our asses kicked, you know? But now I'm walking down the street, you know, getting in line to see Enter the Dragon and Return to the Dragon. They're high-fiving us. I mean, I'm just a little kid, you know, but they're like, yo, a little man, you know? It's amazing. It's like they've accepted me too, you know? So it's like Bruce really was um, created this sort of, you know, extended family feel. It was like, we're all in this together, you know, under one sky, right? we're one family. Do you still think of yourself Chinese or do you ever think of yourself as North American? You, you, you know what I want to think of myself? As a human being, because I mean, I don't want it sounds like, you know, as Confucius say, but under the sky, under the heaven, man, there is but one family. It just so happened, man, that people like you. So I, I don't think Bruce ever would want to discriminate simply just because whether you're Chinese or Japanese, you know? Yeah, I don't think so either. I just said it was like interesting that, um, that they said like, we wanted to see a, a Chinese lead, but like you're saying, he was actually mixed too because he, and he faced a lot of discrimination because he took on white students. His wife obviously was, you know, a white woman and then his kids were mixed. So he faced a lot of discrimination throughout his life for being mixed and then for being, for having a multiracial family too. Of well, it makes a lot of sense that uh, as some of our leads are part white. Multiracial, yeah, because even, yeah. even Bruce himself was multiracial, yeah. You're even more of the other, not just Asian, but you're mixed with it back then. It was like, you, you don't, like, you, you're- You don't belong in anywhere, yeah. You don't belong yeah. in either, exactly. yeah. And even as a, as I'm full-blooded Chinese, but like, I was born in America, so my sensibility is American. So whenever I go to Asia, I don't feel like I belong. Right. You know, I don't belong there and I don't belong here either, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, our, it's, yeah, it's our, who we are as, as, as mixed identity people and, you know, Asians in America. <laughs> I feel like a person in the world, honestly. <laughs> like, I just, I, I've, I'm Chinese, Spanish, African, Native American, Portuguese, and Sephardic Jewish. So if I want to feel at home or like I belong anywhere, I just have to like make a space for myself, you know, <laughs> because there's, there's not, there's no space that exists for me. If I want to be like, oh, now I'm in Chinatown, I just have to be like, hi, I'm, I'm here. I'm, this is me, you know, <laughs> you don't like me. Oh, well. <laughs> That's great. That, you know, that speaks to your upbringing and your parenting, you know, if you have that confidence, that's awesome. I mean, it's either that or you hide under a rock. <laughs> like, we're, so what true. else am I going to do? Yeah, that is so true. <laughs> you know, being out in the world. <laughs> yeah, and then I feel it like, uh, like, just my existence, especially in San Francisco, like, like, remaining here is just like, like, the fact that I exist here is an act of rebellion or resistance, you know? So I'm like, mm. oh, okay. So, um, what's next for you is, um... Boogie in March, and then what is the short film called? A Father's Son by Patrick Chin, and I actually have an interview for that <laughs> after this. Oh, awesome. Um, That's so great. Yeah, so I'm excited about that. Uh, Ronnie Chang is going to be amazing. He's a very talented guy, as you know, you've seen him in his work on The Daily Show, and, and he's also going to be in the new Marvel movie, Shang-Chi. Yeah. And so the last two years, I got to play Father to like Jason Tobin, you know, Taylor Takahashi and Ronnie Chang, you know, it's like, yeah, I, I had, it's been quite an amazing trip, you know, like I never thought I'd be like the Asian dad. You You're know? Everybody's but dad did, has Asian dad. That's I kind of so aged cool. into that role, you know, like That's when so I was awesome. at a time. It's the perfect movie. role for you. Like took a break <laughs> from acting to be a stay at home dad and then came back to be everybody's favorite badass Asian dad. That's like so <laughs> perfect. Wait, That's, do you know the release date for the father and son? Uh, it should be soon because he's doing interviews for it now. I don't know. So the February, actual. March ish. Yeah. We'll put it if I find the date. I'll put it in the description of the video. I, I, or I'll let's, or I'll send you a note. Yeah. Awesome. That's so cool. Okay. Well, I think we're about at an hour now. So thank you so much for this interview. I was so looking forward to it, and um, this is really awesome. And. I'm going to be sharing this on like my Asian group. So I know like a lot of like young Chinese Americans will be seeing this, which I'm really excited about. 
Um, awesome. and yeah. well, thank you. Thank, thank you for you. speaking Let's with me. In touch. And yeah, maybe we'll do another one in a few months or something. Get some more sure. stuff out. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This has really been a pleasure. Take care, you too. Bye. Bye. Happy New Year, too. Happy New Year to you. Go ahead, Bye. Bye. Bye.